Tonight on Huckabee, Georgia Congressman Buddy Carter, amazing sleight of hand artist Rocco Solano, Huck's hero Dr. Susan Campbell, American Idol season five winner Taylor Hicks. That's Dre Corley at the Music City Connection. And I'm your announcer, Keith Bilbrey. And now, here's Mike Huckabee! Thank you very much. Great audience here in our theater, and we have a terrific show lined up. So just get back in your easy chair, put your feet up, and enjoy the next hour of absolute entertainment. Now, let me tell you that this being Easter weekend, I was taken aback a couple of weeks ago when I saw a video of a well-known Southern Baptist pastor who stated that we shouldn't be preaching about the infallibility or authority of the Bible because it might be offensive to non-believers and that we ought to just focus on the resurrection and the love of God. This same pastor was soft-pedaling the Bible's teaching on human sexuality and essentially said that sexual deviancy eh, wasn't that big a deal and we ought to give our attention to other sins. But frankly, I kind of got the impression he didn't give very much attention to any sin of any kind. More that we ought to just tell everybody how much God loved them, like they were, not to be concerned about a change of behavior. Now, I'd really like to believe that what he was saying is that any sin, doesn't matter what it is, but any sin separates us from the Father and that a sin against nature itself is not worse than any other sin. But the overt push to say, that the veracity of the Bible was not that important, that's where I choked on his words. I mean, after all, by what authority do we even have for the story of the resurrection? I mean, I'm pretty sure that the source for the essential doctrine of the bodily resurrection of Jesus is in fact, the scriptures. If the word isn't all that important and we can dismiss the parts of it that make us uncomfortable and that might be in direct conflict with modern culture, then we've undermined the historical assurance of Jesus having overcome death and sin by dying on the cross and achieving the ultimate victory for our eternal life by his physical resurrection. Look, I admit I'm a pretty simple guy, okay? I believe the Bible as adamantly now as I did when I was 18 and a college freshman. I just don't have any other source that I really trust that presents God's pattern for life or that will give me the template for living life other than Holy Scripture. So when I hear someone smugly telling me not to get wrapped up by what the Bible says and just go with my feelings of love for everyone, I kind of put my engine in reverse and look for a different spiritual road to travel. The Bible has always been in direct conflict with the culture of the day, whatever the day was. Whether it's the subject of greed, unforgiveness, anger, adultery, theft, violence toward others, the biblical message provides a stark contrast to the worldly admonition to just do it if it feels good. I absolutely believe in the actual death, burial, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, I do. The entirety of my faith depends on that. Without the blood of the Messiah to cover my sins and his resurrection to empower us to conquer death, I mean, the Christian faith is nothing more than a nice, benevolent, benevolent philosophy of do-goodism. And it was presented by a really nice, mild-mannered carpenter turned teacher. But I think most of us realize they were celebrating Easter, not because of bunnies and painted eggs and a lot of one time a year people showing up for church. I mean, I celebrate that the inerrant, infallible, and inspired word of God tells me the historically true story of God becoming a human and living without sin to become my substitute and my sacrifice. I celebrate that he carried my sins and your sins to the cross where he died a brutal but voluntary death. 
And I celebrate that not even death could stop him. And that because he lives, I will live for all eternity. Not by virtue of my having done something for God, but because he did something for me. I've got no problems with some of the traditions surrounding Easter, whether it's the hiding of some eggs or chocolate bunny rabbits. But I do have a problem if we base our faith on what we think, feel, or believe, rather than on what God says in the book that he gave us as his divine roadmap to live life on earth and experience everlasting life in heaven. And that's why I will absolutely celebrate Easter as I gratefully acknowledge what God has done for me and never what I might think that I have done for God. Earlier this year, Georgia Congressman Buddy Carter introduced a bold piece of legislation, and it's all about throwing out the current tax code, getting rid of the IRS, and replacing it with a national consumption tax. It's simply called the fair tax, and it means that you keep every penny in your paycheck. Yeah. Now, especially as tax day approaches, I'm sure that a lot of us wish this would become law sooner rather than later. Please welcome to the show from the first district of the state of Georgia, Congressman Buddy Carter. Well, we're going to get into the fair tax and dissect that, but how can we start without acknowledging that this week has been a little bit on the crazy side? A former president indicted by a prosecutor in New York. What does this bode for the country and for civility? Well, first of all, this is a sad day, a sad day for our country, a, a, a sad day for all of us, and, and certainly a sad day for justice. I mean, you know, the laws were created to 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 fight criminals and to, uh, to protect us, not to go after individuals. And unfortunately, this prosecutor in New York has chosen to do just this. He, he's chosen to go after someone. I mean, this was a campaign promise that he made. Uh, he made the promise that he was going to go after Donald Trump, and he has done that, and it's very unfortunate. And, and certainly the fallout, if you will, has been unfortunate. Um, it was so disappointing for me to hear the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, say yeah. that, well, he's got a chance to prove himself innocent. <laughs> yeah. You know, what is that about? You know what I think? I think that, you remember when she ripped the State of the Union in half? I was there. I remember it well. I think she also ripped the Constitution in half and forgot what that said, because she sure missed that part of it, didn't she? She certainly did. And, and again, someone who has held that office, and which I have a deep respect for, being a member of sure. the House of Representatives, um, just very, very disappointing. All of it is disappointing. It, it, it's just as if this administration has weaponized the Department of Justice and the FBI. And just a very, very sad time in our country's history. One of the big questions, should Republicans say, okay, if this is the new playbook, if this is how we're gonna operate, then we're gonna start impeaching officials and, and pushing for indictments. Is that where this is headed? I do think you will see um, investigations into exactly what has happened here, and, and certainly you should. That's yeah. the responsibility of Congress. Congressman, one of the reasons that I'm very happy to have you here is because you have uh, sponsored the fair tax bill in Congress. Most people, they just hear fair tax. I remember the first time I heard it back in 2007. And people would say, are you for the fair tax? I said, well, of course I'm for a tax to be fair. And they said, no, 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 the fair tax. I didn't know what they were talking about. Somebody handed me the book written by Neil Bortz and John Linder, former Georgia congressman. I read it and it absolutely changed my outlook on how we could supercharge this country's economy. When did you first hear about the fair tax and when did it sort of come to you, I got to sponsor this bill? I think I probably heard about it um, probably in, before you did in yeah. 2007. I'm, I think I heard about it before maybe in the early 2000s, right after it came out. John Linder, of course, was a member of Congress after he left his chief of staff, Rob Woodall, um, who actually wrote most of the bill. 
Um, he took it over, and yeah. then when Rob left Congress four years ago, he asked me if I would take it over, and of course I was delighted to. When I ran for Congress eight years ago, I made it my pledge that it would be the first bill I would co-sponsor, and it was, and I have um, continued to sponsor it, and thank goodness it has found a, a second wind, if you will. You know, it's, it's a bill that I think if people fully understood it, they would realize it's not a Democrat versus Republican bill at all. In fact, I've often said, I don't know why the Democrats haven't latched onto it, taken it, and championed it, because it is a very powerful bill for people who are in the struggling part of our economy. It's really better for them than it is for the people at the top of the economy. Absolutely, it's better. For those who are making thirty-five dollars to $50,000 a year, this is going to save them on taxes. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. It, it, you know, it's fair, it's simple, it's preferred. Let's face it, no one likes to pay taxes. Yeah. But given the choice between an income tax uh, a payroll tax and a consumption tax. They would prefer a consumption tax right. because you're in control of them right now. And that's why the establishment doesn't like it because they lose control. That's right? it. That's right it. now they're telling you what you're going to pay. And But if, and if you have a consumption tax like we have here in Tennessee, like you have in Texas, like mm -hmm. you have in Florida, no income taxes, you have only consumption taxes, and they're doing fine, by the way, some of the strongest yeah. economies around, then you're in control. When we come back, we're going to talk about how this works and how practical it is and how simple. But before we go, I think maybe I could tell our audience something they will like that we can get into. The best thing about the fair tax, it eliminates the IRS once and for all. How could it get any better than that? <laughs> well, the congressman's going to stick around. We have a whole lot more to talk about on the fair tax and much more when we come back. Stay with us. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on Twitter. And welcome back. We are visiting with Congressman Buddy Carter of Georgia. We're talking about the fair tax. Uh, what, what I think really made me just sit up and say, wow, this would be transformational. Mm -hmm is that no longer would we be penalized, which is what a tax does, for anything we produce. Our work wouldn't be taxed. Our savings wouldn't be taxed. Our death wouldn't be taxed. Capital gains on something where we made a decent investment wouldn't be. I mean, it's kind of like life is supposed to work. You don't punish people for doing what's right and what's good, but our tax system does. It absolutely does. It's one of the most regressive tax codes out there. And, and that's what makes it so good is that uh, here we have an opportunity to, with a big idea. You just mentioned a big idea. And that's what Washington's supposed to be yeah. about, big ideas. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to, to reform the whole system. Keep in mind now, this is going to capture the underground economy too. Those people who are over here, who are not supposed to be yeah. over here, they're going to be paying the sales tax yeah. now. They're going to be paying a consumption tax. Tourists, they're going to be doing the same thing. Big corporations, people who are very wealthy, that's one of the big criticisms of, of the left. They say, oh, the rich don't pay their fair share. Well, they're going to be paying sure. exactly what they're consuming now. And they consume a lot more than, than other people do. And most people don't think about the fact that prostitutes, pimps, gamblers, and uh, drug dealers, they're not filling out a 1040 form every April and saying, I made $400,000 selling meth on the streets. That doesn't work like that. So they're not paying the tax. But they drive nice cars. And when they buy them, they're going to pay the tax. So we won't have to be paying our taxes and theirs anymore. Absolutely. And, you know, we did one of the first pieces of legislation that we passed in the Republican-controlled House was to eliminate the hiring of 87,000 IRS agents. I Amen. Know you, yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I know you find it hard to believe, but those 87,000 IRS agents were not hired to make sure that you get your refund quicker. That's not the reason they were. What? I'm <laughs> no, shocked. No. Congressman's shocked. <laughs> 
But here we can eliminate the IRS. Yeah. We can do away with it. There will be no need for it. April 15th would be just another beautiful spring day in America without having to worry about taxes. What I think is uh, also very powerful about it is that, you know, if you buy used things, you wouldn't pay tax on it because it's already been taxed. That's right. So you said something a moment ago that really I think people need to take to heart. You control how much tax you pay. You want to buy a lot of stuff? You'll pay taxes on it. You, you, are you a cheapskate? Don't want to buy stuff? You won't pay taxes <laughs> on it. have been talking to my wife, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, she told me that was you. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I don't think people recognize that uh, so much of the tax we pay, we don't even know we paid it. it. That is a great point. It's embedded. Have you ever looked at your paycheck? Have you ever looked at your paycheck <laughs> to see how much you're making and how much you're actually taking home? Hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how much the government is taking out of your paycheck. That's why people in the thirty-five to $50,000 range, they are the ones who are going to benefit the most from this. They get their whole paycheck. You Absolutely. Know, how hard will it be to get the fair tax through Congress? Because there are people who say, oh, that fair tax, it just means you're going to raise taxes. Untrue. Right now, when you look at your, your taxes, what's embedded in the price of something is more like 25%. The fair tax will be set at 23%. Now, that is a lot. I get it, and I understand that. But it is less than what you're paying now. And again, you will have control. Yeah. You will have control as opposed to Washington, D.C. saying, oh, if you buy this, we'll give you uh, a tax credit or a tax break. You will have the, that control now. And, and, you know, if you listen very carefully, if we pass the fair tax, you can hear water gushing out of the swamp because yeah. that's what it's going to do. <laughs> the other thing, it will bring foreign investment to our shores, the likes of which we have never seen before because money flows where it's not punished for being productive. And I think what you mentioned a moment ago, people don't think about, well, you buy a loaf of bread, you're not just paying for the bread, but the company that made it, the farmers who grew the wheat, all of them had to pay tax and they carry that tax into the cost of the product. So if you take the tax out of it, everything gets less expensive. So the fair tax means you actually know what you're paying. Right now, you have no idea how many taxes that are built into every single thing we have. And what it does is it rewards hard work. It, it rewards innovation. It rewards success. And that's what we should be doing. We should be rewarding instead of penalizing. And then this, the current tax code penalizes. Well, I want you to know, by sponsoring the fair tax, you become one of my very <laughs> endeared heroes in Congress. And I want you to be successful. I will do everything I can to help be an advocate for the fair tax, because I truly believe it would be just unbelievable for the economy. Great. Please come back. We'll talk about it some more. We Thank will. you for your service to the people of Georgia and America. Great to have you here. Good to be here. And remember, he is alive. Yes, he is. Thank you, Thank you Congressman. Thank you. Well, as we always say, Huckabee.tv, that's the place you can get connected to all of our guests on social media. We've got links that you can follow the Congressman and sign up for his newsletter if you want to keep up with him. For more information on the fair tax, you can also go to fairtax.org. Right now, we're going to go over to Keith Bilby so he can tell our audience what we have coming up on the rest of the show. Well, up next, the humorous news on in case you missed it. And later, American Idol winner Taylor Hicks performs. You're watching Huckabee. And welcome back. They were playing a song, one of my favorites, it's called uh, Hold On Loosely, and it was written by Jeff Carlisi, who was one of the founders of the band 38 Special. He's a very close friend of mine. Wow. And he watches our show every week. So Jeff, thank you for giving Trey Corley and the Music City Connection a wonderful piece of music to play. And don't they play it well, because oh, they're the best they're there the best. is. Good man, Jeff. Indeed. 
Well, you may have heard about the Steps of Paul Mediterranean Cruise, which I'm going to be leading. It's just around the corner. It really is October the 29th through November the 7th aboard a spectacular cruise ship just for our group. Comedian Shonda Pierce will be joining us, along with Larry Gatlin and many more special guests. Now, there's still time to be a part of this relaxing but inspirational journey. So stop thinking about it. Sign up today at thegreatesttrip.com. Well, just in time for Easter, it is a hippity-hoppity-themed edition of In Case You Missed It. All righty, grab your Easter baskets. We're going hunting for the week's most eccentric. Did you catch that? Uh, uh, eccentric. Eccentric, yes, indeed. Uh, See what I did there? E yeah. G -G. Uh, there you go. Uh, eccentric news on a special Easter edition of In Case You Missed It. Now, did you know that Americans spend over $2.6 billion on Easter candy? Ooh. Billion? Yeah, and that's just at Trey's house, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. And he's true. Most of it. Yeah, it's true. CandyStore.com surveyed Americans to find their favorite and their least favorite Easter candies. Oh, I want to hear this. Well, no surprise, candy corn yeah. made the worst candy list. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's nasty. But they've renamed it bunny corn. <laughs> Here's a tip. It doesn't make it taste any better. <laughs> Generic jelly beans also made the worst list, even though they're the only candy that really does look like something that a rabbit would leave behind. You wonder what that rabbit's been eating, too. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Surprisingly, one of the biggest selling candies, Peeps, came in at number two on the worst list. Really? Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. I mean, people must be buying those for naughty children, right? Yeah. Here's another baffling finding. The number one least favorite candy was Cadbury cream eggs. Oh, no. No, no. This no. surprised me. Yeah. I mean, I thought everybody loved those, well, right? Sure. But anyway, the favorite candy, get this, is Cadbury mini eggs. Oh, that's for people on a diet. Right? I guess. I mean, but <laughs> when do Americans prefer less chocolate? I, I Never heard of it. That's uh, a sin. No. Anyway, they say the problem with the big cream eggs is that they fall apart into goo. Well, that makes it even better. I know. Talk about melting in your hand, uh, you know. Yeah. However, on the plus side, under Joe Biden, those eggs cost less than real eggs. So there's, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, here's what I say is the worst candy, uh -huh. okay? This was spotted on Twitter. Do you know that if you let a chocolate bunny melt, it turns into a chocolate Jack Nicholson from The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it, doesn't it? I think right? I'll try that. Anyway, a couple more interesting facts, Easter facts here. 81% of parents steal candy from their kids' baskets. No. Yes, they do. I'm I surprised. would never do that. Yes, you did. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I'm surprised it's not a higher number. I guess people weren't honest when they said <laughs> they didn't. Anyway, I consider that a very valuable life lesson for kids. Guard it or lose it. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Instacart reports that during Easter week, sales of ham leap by 254%. Oh, that's, wow. just, that's just the Gov's house. That's what's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it is. I would take offense, but you know Trey's right about that. I know you love your ham. I know. Absolutely. I do love my ham. Ham and bacon. Mm -hmm. I do love it. By, by the way, do you know for an unpopular candy, there are a lot of flavors of peeps, including... Pumpkin spice peeps, Dr. Pepper peeps, hot tamale peeps. Hot and tam Yeah, hot tamale peeps. Why? Who wants that? And pancake and syrup peeps. I mean, I prefer to just pour syrup directly onto my peeps. There you go. <laughs> they also have something called mystery flavor peeps. Think of it, mystery flavor. I don't trust that. Hey, here's a tip. Never eat anything that bills itself as a mystery flavor, okay? Just they made a bad yeah. batch, and they're trying to sell it. That's, That's something like that. Anyway, for those who just can't get enough Peeps, you can now start every day with a big bowl of Peeps breakfast cereal. That's disgusting. It's Finally. Like, yeah, it's like eating your <laughs> basket of Easter candy for breakfast. And Keith, I know you already did that. I did. Right? Yes, I did. Anyway, it's time for one of my favorite Easter traditions, awkward Easter bunny photos. CBS yeah. News compiles some of the best. Here's the first one. You know, I think I'd react the same way. I would too. That yeah. bunny would scare me. It does. He looks suspicious, doesn't he? What is here's scary? Our, I know. Here's the next one. Look at that girl's face. <laughs> she is so trying to pretend that everything is okay. Honey, we know it isn't. Is he eating? Uh, this next one. 
All right, go ahead and laugh, big brother. Uh -huh. <laughs> and here is another satisfied customer. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I love this little girl, because she's not afraid of the bunny, but I'm gonna tell you something. Not one her of these. parents had better be afraid of her. That's right. <laughs> Finally, the most awkward Easter bunny encounter of all time. Here it is. You remember this last year? Joe got lost, <laughs> and the Easter Bunny had to come and tell him which way to go. Anyway, my Easter wish is that this year the Bunny will take him aside and just leave him there, okay? <laughs> All right, before you start throwing eggs, we're gonna wrap this up. But until next time, remember, we read the news. Well, coming up, the life-giving Hux hero, then the mind-blowing magic of Rocco Salato, all ahead on Huckabee. And welcome back. My next guest has spent her career in the field of neonatology after seeing a need for safe, pasteurized human milk for high-risk babies. Today, her vision has become a reality, and it provides life to these most vulnerable little ones. And that's why she is our Huck's hero this week. Dr. Susan Campbell, and I have practiced neonatology in Middle Tennessee for over 30 years. So my motivation in starting Mother's Milk Bank of Tennessee is I saw very tiny infants born very prematurely who did not make it in the NICU or had serious abdominal consequences of their stay in the NICU. There are just so very many benefits when the mother can't provide her own milk to being able to have donor milk available that's been safely pasteurized and tested to make certain that no bad bacteria would be transmitted to the babies. I was so concerned about being able to save babies' lives that even before my retirement in 2019, we had started working on having a facility for the state of Tennessee. In 2021, we finally were able to open this facility that you see, which is a state-of-the-art pasteurization facility for donor human milk. This has been almost a half a lifetime dream for me to be able to have this kind of facility available for our state. This is my give back to the community where I served as a neonatologist for so many years. And I would love, love, love to see necrotizing enterocolitis become a never event. I can't tell you what this means to me to be able to finally, after so many years of working on this project, to be able to provide safe, pasteurized donor human milk to our hospitals in Tennessee to take care of their most vulnerable tiny babies who desperately need it. Oh, how beautiful. Well, please welcome the executive director and co-founder of Mother's Milk Bank of Tennessee, Dr. Susan Campbell. Dr. Campbell, thank you for being here tonight. Oh, is it my pleasure? We're so glad to have you as our Huck's hero. I am fascinated that you, you spent most of your life as a physician in neonatal care, and you saw things that kids were experiencing because they didn't have natural mother's milk. And so they were being given a chemical of a formula mm -hmm. and you saw how much of a difference that could make for them. Correct. You know, we saw so many technological advances. Uh, it was amazing to see that we were able to find a way to treat their lungs. We were able to find a way to ventilate babies. Tiny babies could survive that hadn't been able to survive before. But the most devastating thing would be when they were a couple of weeks old and they were starting to be fed, to see their little bellies get distended and they'd have issues with feedings, we'd have to stop feedings. 
And there was a period of time where neonatologists were, so, and I think this still occurs, they're so concerned about the entity called necrotizing enterocolitis that we would stop feedings, sometimes for a week or 10 oh. days, and we would have them on really strong antibiotics, we would do blood cultures, and it just was devastating. So what happens when these same babies are given natural mother's milk? The amazing thing is the tolerance that they're mm. feeding. All of a sudden, they don't have to stop feeding so many times. Their little tummies stay, you know, not as distended or have issues. Now, we still have a very rare case of necrotizing enterocolitis because we don't fully understand the causes of it. But we do know that there are factors in human milk that help close the tight junctures mm. in the baby's intestine and that protects the intestines from allowing big molecules to get across or bacteria to get across that could get in the baby's bloodstream and cause infection. So it does protect them in that way. You know, sometimes I think it's hard for us just to step back and realize that God made uh, mother's milk for a purpose. It's healthy for the baby. But there are obviously some women who maybe can't lactate, so they can't feed their own babies, and you get people to donate mother's milk and create a milk bank. This is amazing. I mean, it sounds so simple, but I know it's not quite that simple because there are a lot of permits and processes that you have to deal with. One of the things that I like to say is that um, the milk, these mothers are so self-sacrificing. It's amazing. They have not started out many times to pump milk just for the milk bank. Mm -hmm. They've started out to express extra milk. So when they go back to work, they'll have milk for their own babies. And what they find is that we have these mega producers a lot of times that they just fill freezers full of milk <laughs> and they've worked so hard to collect it. They don't want to just, you know, pour it down the drain, yeah. so they want to find a place where it can help folks. Um, my husband likes to say that um, most people know that human milk is important for their own baby, but they don't recognize it can actually save these tiny babies' lives in the NICU. Well, you're obviously saving the lives of babies that otherwise would have been sick, and I hope that people will make contact with you because this is something that could happen in all 50 states, somebody could take your model and they don't have to reinvent the wheel because you've already done it. Well, I'd like to say it was my model, but we actually are a member milk bank with the Human Milk Banking Association of North America. And there are 31 milk banks mm. right now in the United States and Canada. But if you compare that with a country like Brazil that has over 200 milk banks, wow! I wish there were a milk bank in every state in, in the country because we could, we, I think we can use all that milk to help so many babies. You know, I hope that uh, your being with us will maybe inspire a whole lot of people across the country and we can beat Brazil and do it even better. Thanks for a lifetime of service, not just this recent project, but your whole service, well, saving the lives of babies. Thank and we're you, Governor, to have you. and I have a gift for you. Oh, thank you. Thing. One wow. of our t-shirts. How about that? It says love in every drop. Love in every drop. <laughs> love it. Well, if you would like to donate milk, or if you'd like to donate funds, or your time as a volunteer to help Mother's Milk Bank of Tennessee, if you go to Huckabee.tv, we will connect you. Right now, Keith is going to milk the rest of this show for all it's worth by telling us what we have coming up next. Well, don't close your eyes. Award-winning magician Rocco Solano is next. And later, the very talented Taylor Hicks performs. Huckabee.tv and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. This next segment I'm pretty excited about because we've got with us Rocco Solano, one of the world's most innovative magicians. He is the recipient of two Merlin Awards, the Gold Lion Award, 
and nine nominations as Magician of the Year by the Academy of Magical Arts. He's performed for celebrities from Michael Jackson to the Queen of England. And tonight, he's performing for us. Would you please welcome the amazing Rocco Solano. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. You're right out there. I mean, those people got to see up close what you were doing. They were so, so beautiful watching us, watching wow. our faces. Thank you so much for having me. We're so me on glad your to show. have you, Rocco. I've been willing this for years. I'm serious. I'm I know glad to you have are you. a strong, powerful man of God. Well, thank you. Let me ask you a question. Ask you, me away. Do you believe in miracles? I do. Yes, I do. You know, Einstein says that there's two ways to live your life one is if miracles don't exist and the other as if every day's a miracle. Mm. Can I tell you a true story, a miraculous sure. story? There was this young couple in love, but the doctor diagnosed the mother that she wasn't able to have any children. Well, God can do what no man can do. Yeah. And guess what happened? The woman got pregnant and had a little baby girl, <laughs> and then she became the governor of Arkansas. <laughs> Check that out. Yes, indeed. So we believe yeah. in miracles. Yes, we do. That's right. Yes. You know, it says in Isaiah 1, 5, before I was there before I even formed you in your mother's womb, God was already there. Yeah. That's how it is, man. So it you're is. a recipient of a miracle. So Absolutely. right now, I want to pr produce a little, make a little magic pearl that I can give to your ah, daughter. Okay. It's a gift, a All right. pearl. Okay, we're going to do it together. All right. You're going to make a little pearl for your baby girl. Okay. Okay, now you know how pearls are made, right? 
Yeah, the oyster, oyster. and the now look, sand and all that This is sand stuff. right here. Okay. You're going to take some sand. I'm going to take some all sand. Right. Now, what happens to the oyster is this little piece of sand wants to get inside his body to take him out. Uh-huh. And he, he's been equipped through his creator with this ability to secrete these two materials to help surround the pearl so it doesn't harm him. Hmm. Similar with us. So yeah. you rub the finger like this. Just like that. And let it irritate you. Because you know what the little oyster is saying? <laughs> Gr no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Yeah. Greater is he that is in me that he is in the world. That if you just keep doing that, keep, keep hard, hard, hard. Okay. You say, oh, yes, 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 yes. It's happened, it's happened. Okay. Now what I want you to do is give me all the little baby pearls. Okay. And I'm going to make a pearl miraculously appear. And you're going to give to Sarah. <laughs> to remind her she's the pearl of Arkansas. She's oh. a walking miracle. Okay. So now it's gonna take about three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I want you to reach inside there, and when you feel a pearl, pull it out. Pull it out nice and slow. You feel a pearl? I Is it happening? Yeah, it's happening. Yeah. Happen. We pull it out nice and slow, go ahead. Whoa! <laughs> That's how we do it. That's a whole That's baby girl. Cool. So I want you to take this to Sarah as a gift from Magic Rocco. Thank as a reminder, you. she can walk a miracle and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. God bless you, sir. Thank you. God bless Thank everybody you. here, man. Thank how you. beautiful. Thank you. We loved having Rocco here. If you want info and maybe how to book Rocco's show of hope at your church or community, go to Huckabee.tv. Right now, Keith Bilbrey is going to tell us about some musical magic that is still ahead. Well, stay right where you are. The soul for music of Taylor Hicks is next on Huckabee. Join Huckabee next week for Florida Congressman Carlos Jimenez and singer-songwriter Carla Cook. Taylor Hicks is the fifth season winner of American Idol. He is a platinum selling recording star, an actor, a TV host, and most importantly, he is the owner of Saw's Juke Joint in Alabama. Name one of the 25 best barbecue spots in all of America. He's got a brand new single that you are going to love. It's called Porch Swing. Please welcome Taylor Hicks. How you doing, Governor? Taylor, I'm doing great. We're so thrilled to have you here. Thank you. When you were a little kid growing up, did you ever envision that you would one day travel the world and sing and entertain people and make them happy? A little bit. Did you? You thought that. You believed that. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it, everybody's grandbaby or <laughs> son or yeah. daughter could get up and sing and dance. Well, I was one of those grandbabies and one of those sons, and I was always singing. But, but your family encouraged that, I guess, right? They did. Yeah. You know, it was it was tough when you get into your 30s because I was a 10-year overnight success story. So <laughs> when you get into your late, you know, get into your late 20s and early 30s, you know, it's, you know, what I always tell people, you know, that Alabamians will let you know if you can do three things, and that's cook, <laughs> throw a football, and sing. <laughs> what else and do you, you need? I can tell you. They, they, they let me know I could sing, so I, it just took me a while to get to the promised land. You know? This new song that, uh, and we're going to play it here in a few minutes. Port we're going to play it. We are, yeah. yeah. But, but it's such a great song. I, I just think it's like a, it's a visual song of, of people in just enjoying their lives on the porch swing. Well, you know, when we were writing it, you know, we thought of, you know, we were thinking about the idea of the port swing being an iconic centerpiece, yeah. you know, to American history. Um, you know, there was all, my grandmother had a port swing and there was a lot of, you know, your first love was on a port swing, you know, your first breakup was on a port swing. So there was a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that happen around the port swing in, 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 in America, yeah. you know, and we decided to write about it. 
And uh, I just love the song. It's my first single in 15 years. So. You know, you're kind of a renaissance man because obviously we know you from the singing, but you also have done a lot of acting in movies and television. And you own a barbecue restaurant? Well, you know, <laughs> as an entertainer, you have to have a side hustle. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Yeah. You know, as, and, and as I've been, my side hustle has been barbecue. Um, Ain't you know, a bad side into, hustle, oh, brother. It's, it's, well, it's tough. It's one of those things where Alabamians will let you know if you can cook. Yeah, you know? they will. So if you, you know, if your barbecue's not good, they'll probably tell you that you might want to get a day job. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, no, Mike Wilson was the proprietor of Saul's Barbecue in Birmingham. And, um, you know, he was a, uh, you know, he, his test kitchen was his neighborhood. And uh, he was a, uh, he passed away, unfortunately. But we have carried his recipes on to, uh, to great things. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's a blessing. You know, it's a blessing to be able to be a part of, you know, because the same satisfaction that I get out of entertaining people with good music and good song, you know, you ha you put some banana pudding and you put some <laughs> barbecue in someone's mouth. They have that same kind of, they light up, you know. It's and, instant gratification. Absolutely. You know immediately whether they like it or not. Absolutely. Whether it's your music or your barbecue. Well, it's, I appreciate that. You know, Saul was a, was a, was a wonderful person and, uh, we just, we carry his recipes and we make a lot of people happy with it. Next time you come, uh, let's do some cooking on the show and then we'll do music. We'll okay. cover the whole, I'm, the I'm whole down. spectrum. If they'll have me back, I'll do it. Oh, we'll have you back. <laughs> we will have you back. Thank you. All right, Keith Billery, while Taylor is getting ready to sing, why don't you tell the viewers how they can find his latest release, which they are going to want to do and how they can get everything else from Taylor Hicks. To find Taylor's new single, Porch Swing, plus his social media pages, tour dates, and more, just go to Huckabee.tv. Now, performing Porch Swing with Trey Corley and the Music City Connection and Mike on bass, here's Taylor Hicks. Sing him to sleep as the sun goes down. 